Uh, welcome everybody to this um, masterclass, I suppose, in film activism. Um, how people make the films that fight back, why they make them. We're going to have a very simple format today. All of our illustrious panel will get up and do a 15 minute presentation, uh, which is just very informal and casual with some clips just talking uh, briefly about their work and why they've wandered into this particular area. And then we'll have a lovely Q&A at the end and then we'll all go and have a drink or a soda water or something like that. Um, it's a very interesting area because it has its own particular challenges and that's why it's such a great opportunity to have people like um, Mark Gould, Ivan Omani, Nell Schofield and Karina Holden with us this evening because they ha all have most illustrious backgrounds and they've worked across the board in terms of film production and direction and writing and putting things together, um, very different approaches working with big broadcasters and also in small scale projects, working with huge numbers of community members, projects um, that have already got a groundswell behind them and others that that's what they're trying to create. So it's going to be very interesting to drill down into that. Um, I always love to have a George Orwell quote wandering around in my mind because he's the guy. And uh, there's one that's been bandied about a little bit at the moment. Um, during times of universal deceit, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. And if you are embarking on a revolutionary act, there are many challenges um, to that, not least uh, getting the money, <laughs> um, um, but also then distribution. And then the process of the filmmaking for a, an activist film is quite different um, often. So, uh, look, we're going to... Just a personal sort of why should we make films? Do they work? What's the whole point? I remember, just in terms of the environment movement, back before An Inconvenient Truth came out, it was very, very difficult in this country to get anybody in the media to engage with things that I'd been reading in international media, like The Guardian Weekly, for years were questioned here. I remember an editor at the Sydney Morning Herald questioning me about peak oil um, in the 2000s, which I found incomprehensible, but it was part of our insulation, I suppose, at that time, which is now completely opened up. Um, and then an inconvenient truth came along and all the journalists went to see it. And what we've seen happen since then is that there's an environment um, piece of reporting in every newspaper in Australia every day from the different angles. So I really saw that that had a big impact and it proved once again to me that films that fight back really do play a huge role in engaging audiences, leading to behaviour change and helping us all try to work towards creating a better world, which is, I guess, what we're all trying to do. Um, we are going to, you know, I don't know why we're playing my little uh, short animation. I think we're doing it because Brendan Toole loves it. Mm -hmm. um, it's not really, a, it, it was made as a campaign film. I've always been a little bit obsessed because I came into the environment movement and I was told it was all boring um, and that no one was interested. I really wanted to make, uh, to inject some beauty and some lushness into um, campaigning for environment issues and I, I remember when we were trying to get funding from SBS 10 years ago they just said we've got piles and piles of boring films about the environment <laughs> well you know things have changed since then we've had the cove we've had the age of stupid um, cowspiracy the true cost all sorts of things have opened up and across Australia as well um, so this little film probably goes against everything you thought you were going to come and look at um, I don't know how effective it was, uh, but it was effective in this way, in that when it was shown to some primary school children, they got very upset and 38 of them wrote to Tony Abbott. So I think it was a success. <laughs> and if only we'd had the money to roll it out and make more of it with schools, it might have ha um, had more of an impact. But it's, um, it's only brief, so, and um, it is what it is.
So unfortunately, that film made no difference at all. The government since then, things have only gotten worse. Um, the Liberal Party in New South Wales weakened the laws that we were trying to protect um, land clearing in New South Wales people have died, um, is now set to follow the very poor example of what happened in Queensland and Australia is now deforesting the fastest of any developing nation in the world and we're in the top ten of deforesters up there with the Congo and the Amazon which usually strikes people with a bit of shock. So um, moving on straight along now to our first guest of the day, Karina Holden, whose magnificent film Blue um, is certainly not the crowning achievement because she's gone on since then, if anyone's been watching TV in the last week or so, um, to work on Employable Me. She's doing, she's doing currently eight hours of History for Foxtel, a three-part series, wildlife series for the ABC and BBC. Um, she's had an extraordinary career and started in television in 1996. It doesn't seem so long ago to me. Um, and she's worked for the ABC and BBC extensively across Asia, um, she oversaw production of documentary program for Southern Star Factual. She was head of production for Oxford Scientific Films in Australia. She uh, joined the documentary department as commissioning editor for Science and Natural History at the ABC, um, uh, overseeing internal science TV production as the head of Catalyst. I could go on and on. Um, she joined Northern Pictures as Head of Production and Development in 2013 and has been part of the company's expansion as a super indie, which is an interesting thing to be. So um, please welcome to the presentation area, Karina. <laughs> We're just going to do it there. Cool. Hello everyone, thanks for coming this evening. Um, I'd like to thank Ausdocs for having us and for having this important conversation about film and activism and even just knowing that I'm a speaker at this thing called film activism helps me move forward and define my role and why I'm working in this industry. Um, and I, it's something that I've been seeing myself more of over time and even when I started the project that I'm going to be talking about tonight. I knew I was making an impact film, but uh, I guess it's you start to realise that you know things snowball, and I'm in the middle of a bit of an avalanche at the moment in regards to this. Um, the The film that we were going to uh, feature tonight is a film called Blue. I'm not sure if um, many of you have seen it. A couple of nods. Um, so I'll, I'll talk broadly, but I also thought maybe because I assume a lot of you are filmmakers. Um, or have projects and that you're thinking about uh, being film activists as well, and you probably a lot of you are, that talking about the toolkit of how we make these films and how they're different to traditional broadcast models or even general um, theatrical uh, documentary films. And so maybe we can talk a bit about that. Um, but maybe we can run the trailer so that those of you who haven't seen the film might be able to get a glimpse at what Blue was about. No matter where you live on our planet, you're connected to the sea. Yet in my lifetime, half of all marine life has disappeared. This is a hidden crisis falling on silent shores. I knew 40, 50 years ago, no young person today will ever see it. The barrier reef has changed dramatically over the years. They are now one of the most threatened animals on Earth. There it goes. There it goes. The ocean has done so much for us. Now there's an opportunity to do something meaningful for the ocean to offer it our protection. The ocean is the mother of all life on this planet. 
we can save our ocean and the life it supports, but it requires action. This is our home, our future. When you hold precious life in your hands, you can't help but feel we can do more. Do you think one person can make a difference? One person can make a difference. So I was lucky enough to be part of a uh, part of an, a, a thing called Good Pitch, and some of you may have heard about that. And uh, in the second year that it was run, there was an opportunity for an environmental film to be part of that process, and we were lucky enough to be selected uh, to pitch and be able to receive some funding. But very important to that process was the the funding wasn't uh, merely for production. In fact, if you didn't have production funding, you didn't even get a look in. The funding was very largely about uh, the impact campaign around it. So when this film was designed, it was very much designed around uh, it being this thing that we have, we have different names for them these days, but my definition of what we did was an impact film. It was there to create change. And we worked this paradigm and it was very much, I think these are really interesting questions that we had to have an answer to in setting out on our journey. And, and I'll share them with you because they're these five specific questions. What is your film about? Which we all need to know, right? Uh, what do you want to change? Uh, what do you want to make happen? Slightly different tweak on that and potentially more active. And what are you up against? And finally, how will you define success? I think those are really interesting questions for you to ask when you're in that pre-production or that conceptual phase of coming up with a film. It's not just a story that you want to tell to raise awareness and I think that we probably always say that about films you know it's about creating awareness can we actually define and put KPIs against our films like people do our um, you know in our uh, whatever when we get assessed for our jobs right um, so I, I mean, I think you understand what the film is about. It was, you know, when we started this process of making the film, uh, we thought we were making a film potentially on the Great Barrier Reef. I mean, you guys know exactly what we're up against here with Adani. We thought we were going to be making a reef film. Um, but because we actually had the opportunity to expand our story and there was all these things that were starting to drop around us, like uh, the Living uh, Blue Report published by uh, WWF, stated that uh, by 2050 we would have lost all half of all marine vertebrate life and they just felt like god nobody's actually told this story you know we've told parts of the story but maybe we need to just attack this as a whole um, so that's what we kind of we set off to to tell something in a really global sense and i'm glad we did because that ended up becoming part of how the film has uh, interacted with communities as we've moved beyond um, so the the idea of uh, what do we want to change? Well, I think that, I mean, we, you can see the use of hashtags. You can see the way that Ruth has used her websites and, and we did this as well. It was about behaviour change and it's giving that audience the opportunity in the, in the room itself to walk away and go, what is this about? Um, what can I do? And so we had that direct engagement with the audience by, in our credit role, providing those ideas but also linking through to the website where we have um, you know far more resources and it all came down to our little fish graphic which I probably should have shown you that clip but it was our fish graphic which built out of a word cloud and it was what are these things and it was about the audience making commitments and those were the 10 commitments of stop eating unsustainable fish avoiding cosmetics with microbeads cleaning up beaches um, no more bottled wa water, refusing plastic bags and straws, investing in ethical companies, uh, supporting marine sanctuary campaigns, changing renew to renewable energy, voting for leaders who prioritise nature and respecting the ocean or respecting your mother, as I like to say in the film, being a mother of a very um, naughty nine-year-old. <laughs> and the mother being our ocean and the mother being the planet and that idea that you know we can we can talk about these things as oh these are great things to have that are healthy and around us but effectively you know if we don't raise this awareness that here's this planet it will exist without us 
but we can't exist without it unless it's healthy. And bringing back that um, idea that, you know, it's, it's not just an economic conversation that we should be having, the ecological conversation of how we are reliant on systems on the earth is so critical and it's just getting left behind. Um, so the idea of what we we're up against is a really interesting thing. And I think you guys were lucky. You had the evil Adani, Mr. Adani and, and everything in that, you know, Hitchcock always says the film is only as good as the villain that you're up against. And so perfect for um, the work that Nell has done. But with um, this film, you know, it's slightly amorphous, but I, I guess my villain in the end was that human complacency. It was the idea that, you know, we, you know we've got this life where we have basically, um, you know, we've, we're ignorant, we consume, and we're not looking at the consequences of this. And so this, this idea that we forgot to take notice of this ocean which we think is beautiful and it stretches out and that it's we're always going to have it in this state um, so making people aware of that so um, how did we do this I guess the thing is that this was more than just the film as I said uh, you know we, we we rolled out we we had our um, we we're lucky enough to have our launch at the United Nations in June last year where we screened to the General Assembly and that was an amazing way to welcome the film to the world. Um, we had transmission films behind us so we were able to do three, um, 30 cinemas over three weeks with a, a typical general release and that in itself is really interesting in that it was the same year that the Al Gore sequel came out and so all of the cinemas themselves said, oh, we've got an environment film, a you know, a release being released this year, why do we need more than one? And we literally had to wait on our hands for four months before we were allowed in the cinemas because of the fatigue. And I think that this is what we're always up against. Um, and since then, since uh, December, we, we did our, our release and then since December we've been in a cinema on demand model and that has been amazing. And I think that that is a really powerful part of activism. It's about engaging communities. And so we've worked with demand films and we've done screenings um, around Australia um, and part of what we're, we're sharing in doing those screenings is we're convening communities and that's where I think these films have such a great opportunity to create change because every time we screen in a dark room and we have a captive audience and we do a panel afterwards and we can have the opportunity to load that panel with you know, traditional owners, or commercial fishermen, uh, climate activists, um, snorkelling clubs, whatever, you know, like people who care, who are part of that community, who bring it together and they say, well, we looked at this, what's it mean for us? And they start a conversation. And I've walked away from cinemas at the end of the night down in um, Naruma or at Byron Bay or out at Bathurst or whatever. And it's been this community who have just gone, okay, let's do a clean up. Let's have an environmental film night. Um, I've got a petition, let's raise money to help Shark Girl, um, you know, turn that Indonesian fishery into a tourism thing. And so they're all small changes, but it's that opportunity to convene that um, I think are really interesting. So um, I think, you know, the, the final thing for me to say, perhaps from getting towards the, the end of this is, um, you know, before I just show a clip, I think that the... The challenge in going into the space that we wanted to as a cinema space and competing with films and, and, and whatever was to create a cinematic feel. But it was always um, also to tell the story in a way that it's a hard story. So how do you bring people gently to it and treat them with respect and don't scare them and don't make them shit their pants? Um, and I think that part of that was the individual journeys of the um, people that we we um, featured and they they were intimate and the experience that the audience has is is very much with them and their gentle guides that take us to a one hell of a place um, but maybe we can roll the clip that shows Jennifer Lavers in a point in the film which I think pretty much globally everybody stops breathing um, we'll see how we go tonight you haven't had the lead in but let's see uh, just a minute of it
a messy but familiar feeling. Okay, water is ready to go in. But by flushing out the stomach, we can see what has been happening at mealtime. feel better. That's going to take 20 grams off of his body mass, maybe more. He's still got a lot of plastic in him. Look, you just feel through there. Oh. Still good. at least a golf ball size lump of rubbish in there. Oh, I can hear it crunching. Uh, so that scene continues when the chick is choking on plastic which she physically has to remove piece by piece from from its throat and you know it's pretty it is pretty horrific but I think that um, you're in a safe space with the people around you it's not angry it's not blaming and accu you know, it's not accusatory it is a uh, I believe that um, you know we lead people to see some dark things and to experience what's challenging but um, uh, you know, potentially in a gentle way, but also in a way that where we come out of the film, you feel like you want to do something and that it's not just a problem that you've been dumped with, that there are solutions and that individuals can make a difference. And so the activation part of um, filmmaking is critical. So thinking about that for any messaging you want to do, the call to action, how do you want to engage people and how are you going to lead them forward so that the experience of watching something has a meaningful payoff for the people who have spent their hard-earned money or taken their time to uh, be with your film. So thank you for being with my film and uh, thank you for all being here and, and looking forward to questions at the end. <laughs> thank you, Karina. Is any of these working? Um, yeah, you've brought up a really interesting point. In fact, I was at a seminar on Sunday where Dr. Jean Sherman, who is agitating about sustainability in fashion, um, was talking about how she was contacted by someone who wanted to make a documentary about a village in China where it is the sole economic driver is skinning live animals because it makes the leather softer. And she was very upset that she couldn't get anybody in Australia involved in making the film and finding finance for it. And as someone pointed out, it was such a horrific thing to ask people to watch that the challenges of balancing what you're just talking about there um, were, were too, obviously <laughs> too great to find anyone who was brave enough to take that one on. Um, so it is about balance. Um, next up, someone who knows all about that, since the days of surfing, um, when she first kind of landed in our consciousness, I suppose, is Nell Schofield, who um, a really fascinating career from teen actress and going to NIDA and then gradually moving through her journalism and her um, television presenting, radio work, across the board, a media entity that we've all been very familiar with and felt comfortable with now for some small number of decades. Um, and Nell, uh, I remember it was about you know 10 or 15 years ago, started to obviously come to grips with issues that she wanted to do something about and moved into the documentary area and has since become a driving force in the Stop Adani movement and is going to talk to us today about her latest effort. Thank you, Nell. I will welcome you to the presentation area. Thank you very much. I will step away. Yeah, it's interesting, you know, you mentioned earlier an inconvenient truth, and that was very much the moment at which I saw that, um, you know, if you want to do something, contact this email address. And I did that and went and um, trained with Al Gore to be one of his climate leaders in 2007. But I had a place in the country um, that I, you know, I got uh, back in 88. But in 91, uh, it came under a coal exploration license. And it was one of those incredible moments where you think you've 
found paradise and suddenly it's being ripped out from under your feet. So we started our little local action group back in 1991, the Running Stream Water Users Association. And, you know, we put in our submissions and we did our things and we went and talked to MPs and we seemed to get nowhere. So when Lock the Gate came along and said, we're not going to take this anymore, we're locking the gate against coal and gas companies, I was actually the first person to donate to that and the first um, supporter. And But it wasn't until four years ago that I went to work with them. And on, well, I guess I was the Sydney coordinator with Lock the Gate on the Land Water Future campaign. And that was because New South Wales was 80% um, under coal and gas exploration licenses and mining licenses. And in uh, I'd never done anything like that. I thought I was sort of alone in the wilderness you know, doing my own little protests, tying myself naked outside coal mines for nobody to see. <laughs> um, but so when I did find Lock the Gate, it was like, yes, we are, we are go. Um, and that's when I first started making little films, you know. Uh, I was given the opportunity to go out and talk to people um, for International Women's Day, actually. It was the first time I went and spoke to a whole lot of amazing women in New South Wales doing stuff on their farms, telling their stories. And yeah, it just felt like I was doing what I was meant to be doing because I, as Ruth said, I'd been working in this space for a long time, producing stuff, um, presenting stuff, being a reporter, but but not really amplifying the voices of these frontline uh, people. And that's what we were doing. And as Mark will tell you, when he comes up to speak, you know, putting these stories on Facebook um, amplifies their voices to an incredible extent. You know, they're out there in Narrabri or wherever fighting Santos and, um, you know, by going out and actually filming them and getting their stories, uh, we can reach a whole lot. We can, you know, have a huge impact. So we did. In that campaign, we brought those uh, licences down from 80% to, to less than 9% in New South Wales. So that was an incredible campaign and I was very much embedded in the campaign um, and, and the films were just a part of it. You know, we were doing forums, um, we were doing door knocking, we were doing all the things, putting pressure on Mike Baird at the time, the Premier, to act and he did. So that was a really great um, example of people power and what can be done. So when I went to work with the Stop Adani campaign, it was like, okay, go out and make the film. It was like, yes, yes. Yes, yes, this is the campaign. This is the climate campaign uh, in Australia. And Australia being the number one exporter of coal in the world, um, our climate campaign is really important, you know. This is the front line. If we let this um, mine go ahead, well, it's pretty much all over for the reef, all over for the climate, all over for the future. So it's, you know, very a critical campaign to work on, but a very very stressful one, as I will tell you in a minute. Um, so Guarding the Galilee was the first half-hour film that I made for the campaign, and that was very much following the, the Lock the Gate model of a half-hour film that you give to the community to put on their own screenings and have um, the discussion, the panel discussion afterwards with experts. So what we did with that film is um, we put together the screening guide, how to host a screening, you know, get a projector, make sure you have some good speakers, uh, as in, you know, so you can hear the film. Um, and also then we had the post-screening discussion. How do you form a group? You know, what to do, the steps, you know, questions to talk about. So it was very much empowering the community with tools to build the movement. So, I mean, in the last year and a half, I guess, the, the, the movement is built to... I think it's nearly 2 million supporters, 100 and 160 local action groups. Dominic's got one in uh, climate, uh, climate change, Balmain Roselle. So, yeah, that's what we were doing, empowering the community. But uh, if we show the first clip from Guarding the Galilee, um, you'll see some old school kind of activism at work. I was born and bred in Mackay and I know the local scene. You know, some of us are motivated by a Christian reason and living out what we believe to be the right thing. And um, anyone who's read anything from Pope Francis, he is very strong on the protection of the environment. And even if that means get, getting out and protesting, that's, that's part of it. 
a member of the Mackay Conservation Group. Um, it was very much a case of going out fishing with this film. You know, I had a few interviews lined up. Um, I should say that the film was made for about 20 grand. I was driving the car, producing. I was doing everything on my own. I had the camera person. That was it. We were just a double act for the shoot. And the edit afterwards um, at Shark Island Productions with Sally. And, and we were given the edit suite uh, by Ian Darling for that, which was an incredible gift. Um, so, yeah, it is possible to make things for 20 grand. <laughs> um, so there's Marianne um, Bailey there. She's obviously a Christian, a teacher. I had no idea that I was going to meet this woman, you know. Uh, she wasn't on my schedule, but it was like, okay, we're going to come and film you. Is it okay? Yes, it's okay. And there she is flyering. So you see, you know, interacting with people going in to um, an Adani roadshow. So all those people are going into that convention centre to... Um, you know, to be spruked the Adani myth that it's going to be jobs, 10,000 jobs, going to be great for the community, great for the region, boom time again for Mackay, which is a, which is a town that, as um, the, the president of the Mackay Conservation Group says in the film, didn't choose to be on the front line of coal, but they are, and it's a responsibility that they're, that they're taking on with these amazing individuals, volunteers. Um, so... What happened with Guarding the Galilee, we, we gave it to the community, we supported them in their screenings, we went along and spoke to them. We did, I went back up to North Queensland for the rollout of a bunch of screenings in those key areas like Cairns, Townsville, Rockhampton. I went, you know, right out to Barcaldon as well, you know, right out near the Galilee Basin to do a screening there. But just this, the importance of these screenings and face-to-face -face discussions with people so the, that film had over 400 community screenings. They're the ones we know of because once we give the link out to people, like the um, Australian Religious Response for Climate Change, for instance, they just run with it. Oh, no, no, <laughs> we're just going to screen it everywhere. So the ones we know about, 400, probably, I don't know, I, I'd say probably about 1,000. And I think, I think we'd probably reach about 10,000 people in that period. So it's okay, let's do another one for Christmas. Let's um, go back out there pick up the story, find out what's happening next. Um, so the second story, the second one, uh, A Mighty Force, again, it was going to be a half-hour film. And I guess the first port of call for that film, for me, was Anoni. <laughs> I don't know whether you know um, Anoni. She's the artist formerly known as um, Anthony of Anthony and the Johnsons fame. Anyway, she did an incredible song that just really um, I had to use. It's called Four Degrees and it and it, it's sort of like a climate deniers anthem. But um, I thought, okay, let's just let's just reach out to Anoni wherever she is and um, see if she'll give it to us or let us use it. So that was sort of the starting point for the second film, apart from um, you know, lining up some interviews with uh, tour operators, marine biologists, a whole range of different people. But I, I guess I should say that the starting point for each of these films was trying to get the involvement of the Wangan and Jagalingu people. So that was, in fact, my first port of call for each of those films um, because they are the traditional custodians of that land where the mine would be built on. But they were really um, reluctant to be seen to be involved in the environment movement because the media grabs onto that and says, oh, you know, you're just a front for the, for the Greens. So they're running a bunch of legal cases challenging the Indigenous land use agreement that Adani has to build the mine and they didn't want to, you know, be seen to be involved in the environment movement in any way. So that was really disappoint uh, disappointing, <laughs> as you can imagine. The first film... I cut together a little sequence, an opening sequence from archival footage from 2015 and it wasn't until the second last day of the edit that they said, no, nah, you can't use that stuff. I mean, it's up there on Vimeo, you can access it, anyone can download it, but they, they said no, so that was um, difficult. Uh, and luckily, my dear friend Michael Caton came on board and, and did the, the voiceover for that sequence and set the stage for, for, this, for the film. Um, 
so yeah, Anoni, we've got, uh, that's kind of bubbling along in the background, I think, could it be possible that we actually get this thing, which is so incredible. Um, but let's have a look at the next clip from A Mighty Force, just to show you how the first film was used by communities. I do it for other young Indigenous people across the country that aren't fortunate enough to have their voices heard like I am. Our connection to country is irreplaceable. I want to be able to come back here with my kids and be like, oh, that's why I used to run around and throw soldier crabs at your uncle and I'm terrified that it's going to be too late. And this is our country and this is our future that's at stake. We are quite a rural town and a lot of our population do rely on the industry for an income and we totally understand that and they feel like it's a personal attack. I think that's just some way people justify their non-understanding of the situation. My main goal in this town is to break down that stigma. Uh, we were hit with a bushfire. I was about seven or eight years old and I remember my parents going out with branches off the trees trying to stop this fire and we lost a car, a tank, all water access, all electricity. Uh, and with seven kids we had to start again. Um, and then in 2014 uh, we had the floods. My mum was 27 weeks pregnant with my little brother and her water broke in the midst of this flooding happening and like yet again having to start from nothing. And for people to try and palm that off as, oh, it's just another flood. You know, it's just another bushfire, it happens, it's natural, it's not. Um, you know, all these companies that just do it for profit when it's affecting people in small communities all around Australia, all around the frickin' world, and it still comes back to money. And you know, you can't eat money, you can't eat coal. So that has um, two clips in it, which was the only footage that I bought, <laughs> the fire and the water, because it's really hard to get access to any, um, you know, climate footage for some reason. I was, I was you know, reaching out to uh, Greenpeace um, and, and it's just very hard to get that kind of footage that you want to, to illustrate that kind of thing. Um, but anyway, I think... I think it worked well. <laughs> uh, but I should also say that with both of these films, what's been incredible is having access to the footage from a bunch of different organisations because the Stop Adani Alliance is about 30 different um, organisations like, like uh, Greenpeace, like Sea Shepherd, like Australian Conservation Foundation. Um, so I had access to a bunch of stuff that really helped um, keep the cost down. <laughs> um, and I guess finally, um, the controversial Anoni sequence. Um, I finally did get permission to use the film and um, really wanted to put together one of those massive um, climaxes for the film. Because um, what happened with the, with the campaign through the year was, I think it was last October, we did um, a massive bunch of human signs around Australia. So we kept, we kept having to come up with these things. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna give people to do? Because this is the wonderful thing. If you, if you can imagine something to give to community groups, they run with it. So we came up with this idea of the, the human signs and we had, I think it was about 60 human signs around Australia from little ones up on the Whit Sundays down to you know massive ones here in Sydney with 2000 people. So that was always going to be the end of this film, you know. We're going to culminate in this great, big, massive display of um, power, people power. But what happened <laughs> was um, my clients, <laughs> I guess I could say, my bosses, they were like, no, you can't use that. And this was like the Thursday after the edit had finished. It was like, don't, you can't, you can't do this, you can't do this. So, I mean, my... Um, 
analogy for the making of this second film, while the first one was just a really wonderful thing, if not very stressful, taking on all the roles and logging all the footage and doing all the things and transcribing all the interviews, um, it, was, it was quite smooth sailing. I didn't <laughs> encounter much resistance, but with this second one, it was very much everything I loved about the film, my clients hated and wanted me to get rid of. So for me, it was like um, really sailing this little tiny pea green boat through the climate chaos to a safe harbour um, and keeping the initial vision intact. Um, so let's have a look at this last sequence that was so controversial that everyone um, thought I should get rid of and I'd love to hear your thoughts. <laughs> yeah, it was funny. Um, I always had the bookends too because it starts with the guy in the tractor. The whole film starts with um, the farmer on the land in the tractor and ends with that sequence. So they're like, we can't have, you know, white men digging up land. <laughs> like, oh no. So it was all those things that um, made this a really difficult film to make, but I reckon it's great. <laughs> I really enjoyed it. I, I, I really enjoy the um, the result and thank Andrew here for being such a fabulous editor to work with. <laughs> yeah, choosing your villain. Very interesting to think how much courage it takes to um, go up against a big corporation. And Adani is such a hot potato in India at the moment as well as here. I know the... Uh, Radio National were going to do a series in India that included the Adani mine but also was about popular culture and all their visas were cancelled. So um, that's the kind of power and influence that these people have. Um, but we'll talk about that more. Thank you, Nell, for that. Um, we're going to go on to... And I hope that you're saving up some of your thoughts for the Q&A at the end. Um, just hang on to those reactions and some of the questions that you might have for the filmmakers. Um, moving, uh, you, you know, Blue has those wonderful scientists sharing so much of their passion and, and individual activists. What Nell's working with is a grassroots movement that's actually Australia-wide and, and worldwide. Um, and now I'm going to introduce Mark Gould to the uh, presentation area. And I uh, couldn't quite figure out what it was about Mark that had changed, whether it was actually... Um, <laughs> working, oh, <it's> <laughs> ...working to save... Um, Bondi Pavilion or all his other activist pursuits that had brought about some sort of change but I found out that he's become a grandfather and that is actually why he is um, slightly... That's your projection. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, that's it. That's what yeah. happened. Um, but, <coughs> you know, Mark's one of those amazing people who has uh, such an illustrious career and like... All of our presenters has had to wear many hats. He's a DOP, he's a writer, director, producer. He can edit um, a little bit. Uh, he's made a series of films that you might know of about the Free Tibet movement, Murder in the Snow, seven of those. Um, for Compass, he made a series on pilgrimages. Um, he's been very involved in the last few years um, and has been growing his beard as a result in the battle to save Sydney. Um, which is which is very interesting, especially what's happened this week with the Berejiklian government um, going into electorate repair mode. The Berejiklian government. Yes, that one. Um, following on from the very good work of, of Baird, who disappeared back into his 700000 a year banking job when things got tough, with the push to develop Sydney and make a lot more money out of our metropolis by squeezing more people into it and developing, developing at the cost of heritage suburbs and, and our tree canopy. Um, he also made Moulin Rouge Girls, which um, has, a high, ha, has the highest ratings record of any four-part series on the ABC. Um, 
He makes a living with mu music coverage in between his docos and you should know, because this is the era of YouTube, that um, Mr. Tibet and the Limbo of Exile has scored over 10 million hits on YouTube. Um, so the sales we don't care about, but um, the fact that all those people have headed on YouTube is very interesting because this is part of the, the terrain that all the filmmakers are um, working with at the moment. So over to you, Mark, to tell us about what you've been up to. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you very much. Uh, Previous two speakers have been working, you know, on on well, one the world stage, Blue. Karina's f film is totally about the world stage, and Nell's films really is about the Australian stage in a world context. I've been working with a really small stage, really tiny, Waverly, essentially. <laughs> I don't, a lot of you would be eastern suburbs types, probably, but those those of you who aren't, Waverly is just not, just we're just on the edge of it. And for the last X years, it's been, it was run by a rather draconian uh, right-wing council who were pro-overdevelopment, pro-amalgamation, pro-everything, ramming more people in, ramming more, just destroying the joint, basically. And that we had a, a pretty ugly mayor who works for Malcolm Turnbull, as a, and she has a very big target painted on all around her, actually. She's a very big target uh, because she's such a horrible person. And a few years ago, I became aware that the environment in which I live, I live in, bon in Bondi Basin, was changing too fast, that the house next door to me was knocked down and there was nothing I could do to prevent a gross overdevelopment next door. Even going to courts I couldn't afford to go to, there was really nothing I could do. All of those planning powers had been taken away from local councils, from local communities. And I started to really get the shits with what was going on in Sydney and my eyes were opened and this is not long before the trees came down and all that, you know, the general neoliberal shit fight that we've seen the last couple of years. In this process, I was asked if I would come to a meeting to save the Bondi Pavilion from being privatised. And I went and I realised they needed some social media and they needed someone with a camera and an editing room who could put together some very, very simple, very short, Vox Pops-based films. Could you run the first uh, clip, please, Alan? <laughs> Freya and I've been dancing here for three years and there's nowhere else that I would want to dance except right next to the sea. Why can't the mayor just listen to us and let the pavilion stay? We really want to keep dancing here. This is a fantastic community asset. As usual, greedy developers and politicians, their politician mates, want to get hold of it. Keep your grubby hands off it. Why don't they put a big wall up here so people can't see the beach? They can charge you for a look. That would be a good idea. That's, that's a great a good, idea. We're going to business business prospect. Fantastic idea. Thirty-eight million dollars. <laughs> I mean, you can surely you can build the wall too. Donald Trump, bring him in. I'm Pat Fisk. I'm a resident, long-time resident of Bondi, and I've used the pavilion uh, countless times. I often go to the theatre there. I always go to the art gallery almost every time something new is on. It's a, it's a wonderful facility. I have a lot of friends with kids who have learned tons of uh, music. Uh, they've, you know, they've really grown um, with, you know, grown, uh, their music has grown and they've grown all the kids programs, the pottery. It's just amazing what the community, how the community has used the pavilion and it should not be privatized. The spirit of the green bands live on. It's marvelous to think that the action that the unions took 40 years ago is still alive and well. And it's great that uh, Rita uh, and, the, and the leaders and, and Peter and other leaders of the, of the CFMEU are carrying out the spirit of the builders, labourers and the green band. And I think that's showing real social responsibility and it enhances the union movement. Politicians ignore citizens at their own peril. If you have ever been entertained at the pavilion, 
done a dance class or taken an art course here, it needs your help now. Help us save Bondi Pavilion. The idea of privatising the pavilion, it seems to me, it's akin to privatising the surf, you know. To deprive the public of something as iconic and as so, and so important as the pavilion just makes me feel sick. It actually makes me feel ill to the stomach. One of the things that uh, people do when they want to uh, allow uh, something to be privatised is that they get the people who control that asset and get it to fall into disrepair, like slumlords. Then everybody says, oh, it's terrible, the toilets are no good, it's going to have to be knocked down, we're going to have to do something about it. And that is the technique, that is the method, the underhanded method they get to take it away from the people. Hello, my name's Dominic Wykenak. I'm a candidate in the Waverley Council election. I'm sitting here in the Bondi Pavilion, and Bondi gets its name from the Aboriginal words Bundi Bundi, which means waves crashing on rocks. Mosaics like the one behind me here in the Bondi Pavilion will be under threat if the Liberals take back control of Waverley Council. When you vote on September 9, put the Liberals last, save mosaics like this and keep Bondi Pavilion for the community. I think it's a disgrace. I think it's another money-grabbing idea from that well-known Waverley Council. I think it would be a huge shame to see it changed. And I'm with Bondi and all the communities of Sydney. There's too much destruction of communities in this city being carried on by well-known councils. There are two or three truly iconic things in Australia. There's the Great Barrier Reef, there's Uluru, and of course there's Bondi Beach, the envy of the world. And the jewel of Bondi, of course, is the Bondi Pavilion. I've always loved it. You don't muck around with things like that. I'd hate to see something happen to there. It's a great community resource and a much-loved building. And I've prepared my own uh, poster. It um, took a long time. It's brief but it says it all. I hope you like it. What is it with you people that keep trying to destroy our cultural heritage? I have one thing to say on the matter. Sam Neill taught me everything I know about sign writing. <laughs> so that's a, a little montage of what we did and started with kids and you know people started sending us stuff on phones you know Sam Neill's clip came VDS vertical video syndrome you know VDS Lakshman you know who he is anyway it was dreadful and, and, the, and the colour was shit it was all out of phase and, and the only thing I could do was pull the colour out build a wipe and try and try and make something but what he said was fantastic it just came down the wire, you know, by email. Same with Ben Quilty's one. Just He just emailed it to me. So gradually we began to build a lot of data. I only did about, I did about, no, I did a lot of shoots actually, but I did the first two or three shoots, um, we got good stuff and we became aware of what the, sort of how effective the campaign was becoming and started to, to build an interaction with an audience. Uh, the Save Bondi Pavilion group developed a Facebook following of I think 6,000 members um, and some of our videos started to really take off and of course we got a few friends and you know the, the group was in fact eight people who sat around having coffee once a fortnight at a table like this and we changed the fate of, of, of Waverley. We changed the government of Waverley. And we, we got the, the Libs out and the Labor Greens Alliance in. It's, it's an extraordinary thing to do. Over nearly a two year period, <laughs> we made a, about 120 short videos. Now, that included repurposing and recycling some of them. Because once you've shot a couple of great performances, well, let's put them together. So let's run the next clip, please. Now, how's this for an idea? 
our Lord Mayor Sally Betts comes to us and said, I've got this great idea. I am going to spend $45 million plus renovating the Bondi Pavilion. Renovating the Bondi Pavilion, how wonderful. But unfortunately, she said, we're going to privatise the top half of the building, which means we, the ratepayers, are being asked to pay for something they intend to take from us. What a great idea. The Bondi Pavilion must remain a community centre, a centre for the arts, a centre for recreation. It belongs to us. Get your hands off the Bondi Pavilion. You see, the PAV is our town hall. It's our community centre. And all you people with young children in Bondi, which is exploding with kids these days, you know very well it's the place where our kids come to play and learn dance, drama, pottery, music. And we cannot afford to lose all of that. Now what is happening now is that Sally Betts has lodged the first stage DA and this is the foot in the door. It's a Trojan horse. So if you want to hold on to what we have here and what it does for our community, I beg you to lodge an objection, to contact your councillors, to go to meetings and insist on meetings because a lot of this has been done out of the public eye. And remember this, there is no business plan for this. The only thing that will save this building is people getting up off their backsides and exercising their power as the community. Thank you. Now that one is a sort of shameless use of celebrity, but they're two lovely fellows. So, you know, what could be easier than pointing a camera at Michael or at uh, Jack, who both Bondi, well, Jack was a Bondi resident, just, you know, divine people to work with, and they just, you know, one take. That's it. So I'll just read you a few metrics from that clip. That clip has had... 14,000 minutes viewed. It's had 38,000 views, 38,037 views altogether. 86,351 people reached. Now that means not everyone clicked on it, not everyone watched it, but they were aware of it. There are 30,092 unique views. That means first viewers. The, the, major, the major demographic that, that liked that particular clip were male 25 to 34, which is exactly the group we wanted to target in that particular case because the kind of new population of Waverley really are young, wealthy family people who are likely to be renters with a couple of kids and actually the, the men are probably from the banking industry or, or associated industries, and they tend to be conservative. So it's very important to try and get that group. Um, we, with many of these clips, as we built up to the elections, uh, little little clip, you know, fifty bucks was spent here, fifty bucks was spent there by the group. It's possible to target three streets or four streets. In, in internet boosting, you can define an area like that big, one ward. Spend 50 bucks and you will find for three days that clip is boosted to those six streets or four streets. So it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful way of targeting. The, the, uh, that clip we paid 50 bucks, we targeted it at what is loosely known in Waverley as the Golan Heights. Uh, sort of Dover Heights, heavily Jewish, conservative, very South African, ex-South African community. And we got an extra 9,000, no, 9,000 people reached and 4,700 views in those, well, it was probably 10 streets, in a space of about three days. So, and, and that ward was won by 140 votes. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary to sit there at, you know, well, it's two o'clock in the morning or midnight sometimes and you're kind of trying to do this in your spare time and you hit publish and you get tick. You watch the counter. 
I'd go and make a cup of tea and you come back 2,000 views with some of them. And by morning, 30,000 views. Uh, one Caton clip, just pure Caton, uh, 57,000 views, 17,000 minutes watched. Uh, yeah, 17,600 minutes watched. Okay? Now, the trick with social media is you've got to get them in the first 10 seconds. There's a few... There's a few um, if you look at the graphs, you can see that a lot of people watch 10 seconds and it f can fall away like that. Or if you've got them, for a couple of days it'll be like that. So your retention is, is terribly important. And it's, it, you've got to kind of follow all that stuff because it's, it, I mean, I don't know much about it, but there are other people who are following it. I was just trying to make little videos and actually stay sane doing it. And I'm not an editor, but I really didn't have much help. I was, there was one person who helped a bit me a bit, so I learned a bit more about editing than I knew. Um, I'm, I'm pr lucky to have my own system. And look, just for fun, um, you've got to stay sane doing this shit. I went out with one guy for 25 minutes and made seven videos. So let's, from, from that 25 minutes. So he was a candidate. This is quite close to the elections. Let's watch the next clip. All right. I'll go that way. I'll go, I'll go down here. So this is the Bondi Pavilion, the heart and soul of Bondi Beach. It would be an absolute shame if this was taken out of public hands and given to private enterprise. This is the soul of Bondi the soul of Waverley. It's been here longer than all of us generations have enjoyed it. It certainly needs repair and it certainly needs to be restored and that's what certainly the Labor candidates will be doing if they get elected at the next election. It needs to be restored, not flogged off to the highest bidder. It needs to stay in public hands so we can enjoy it for generations to come. So the fight goes on. We we won Waverley. Um, now the country. Yeah, now the country. Now Sydney. The fight goes on, and, it will, and, and the battleground will be social media. I'm pretty convinced. If Facebook doesn't collapse, I mean, Facebook is something for old people like me. But um, you know, I, one of the byproducts of doing this stuff is that people ask you to keep doing it. So I get phone calls from all sorts of people. There is a new organisation just being formed. Oh, sorry. Um, people, when you do this stuff, people ask you to keep doing it. And it's kind of fun if you can fit it in, um, which I do sometimes. There, is, there are 150 protest groups in the Sydney Basin. OK? Just think about that. In, the, in, in New South Wales, we are being totally and utterly clusterfucked by neoliberalism. See, we are being screwed. We are being screwed by bad, manipulative politicians with bad policies. <laughs> so, you know, I, I can't help but continue to follow some of these things. Uh, tomorrow is the launch of an organisation called the Save Sydney Coalition, which is a new body which is going to try and bring together the 150-odd protest groups in the Sydney Basin. Um, in order to you know, follow this story. And I, I, I have been, I'm sort of interested in making a long form piece about uh, neoliberalism in, in Sydney in particular. It's a very big subject, it's huge, I've got a lot of data and I don't quite know how to wait, cut my way through it, but I'm still building it up for that reason. But the byproduct of that process are things like this next little clip, which is the last one. Thank you. Right now as we're speaking at Moore Park, we're seeing that there's even more cutting in of the people's land of Moore Park. Enough is absolutely enough. We need to be returning New South Wales to the people. We need a government that is actually going to listen to the people and not be selling off and continuously privatising all of our people's assets. People have to learn to be activists again. They've forgotten. They've gone to sleep. Wake up. Be activists. Go and oppose this because before they know it, They'll be developed. Their home will be developed. They'll be developed. 
they'll be pushed out. We say no way! They say tollway! We say no way! They say tollway! We say no way! They say tollway! We say no way! Because of the rezoning and overdevelopment that's happening in Ramwick as a result of the light rail, by the time the light rail actually opens, it will already be at crush capacity. We want the government to invest in real public transport, yet we see in, at every turn this state government obsessed with privatisation. You can explain every single decision that they make, tollways acting in rich and um, secretive private interests. No other state government has ever been so reckless with public assets, our assets. Why should we let this government get away with it? Right now we have a state government that is an absolute weapon of mass destruction. The people of Sydney need to unite together and stand up and tell Gladys that enough is enough. You have some of the most ideologically extreme governments now in New South Wales. Activism has got to come back to Australia. Activism is what democracy is about. If you don't have activism, you have no more democracy. Uh, activism is fighting the kind of thing you're doing here about overdevelopment, and that's what we people should do. They'd be back. They should be back in the streets, and they should stay there. <laughs> So, so that one was done for no one in particular, okay? It wasn't done for any particular interest group. I just published it and ran around. It's done about 40,000 hits in the last week. Thank, Thank you. you, Mark. <laughs> so from grassroots activism, community, social media, YouTube, we are going to now take a leap with Ivan Omani. Um, to mainstream television and the impact that can be made working in that arena. Um, he started, he's a former lawyer and UN peacekeeper in Bosnia and holds various degrees in uh, law and journalism. Um, he's worked on many multi-award winning um, documentary series, including possibly one of Australia's most famous, Go Back to Where You Came From. Um, also, the marvellous series Hitting Home, um, which has won Walkley Awards and ACTA Awards. Um, he's also taught at AFTERS, um, produced for Four Corners, developed, developed the Logie winning SBS series Law and Order, produced the ABC series Great Southern Land and co-authored the series accompanying the book published by HarperCollins. So please, welcome to the presentation area, Ivan Omani. Hi, <laughs> thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. There's a small uh, uh, communication blip between me and Ausdocs. So I wasn't quite aware that I was doing a presentation rather than just a Q&A. So I've just been furiously scribbling over the last sort of hour things about the series as a result of which, of course, I can't read it anymore. So, um, yeah, I should have taken a page from Sam Neill's playbook, you know, just sort of just three lines, that's it. Um, Mark's footage really made me uh, think back of the, f the, f the first film I ever made about activists. I don't consider myself an activist. I consider myself a journalist, although these days, you know, trying to get to the truth of any matter seems to be, uh, if not as Orwell said, uh, an act of revolution. At least it seems to feel like an act of activism these days. But um, I think I just wanted to make that point that I think there's a difference between activist filmmakers who really from the beginning set out to achieve a goal with the film with a very clear point of view. And then there are films that are made with, I guess, a more journalistic approach, um, whereby the activists probably do the talking for themselves and you can follow their stories and you can tell of their plight. Um, but you, as the filmmaker, are not necessarily either invested in the cause, although you know it helps if you do have a passion for, for the subject. 
Um, but you you want to you want to tell that story as well as you can because you feel that it has a place and that it needs to be told. But maybe the outcome is not as um, uh, I guess is dear to you as as the people on the ground who are fighting the fight. And um, so I come from a slightly different tradition, I guess, of of, of storytelling uh, in, in in that respect. Um, but Mark's footage made me think of the first film that I was ever involved in uh, about activism, which was for the BBC in the mid 2000s. And um, I was sent with some colleagues to do a documentary about the protests that were expected at the G8 in Glen Eagles and the Make Poverty History March, which um, of course was you know, uh, superbly hijacked by, by Gordon Brown when he uh, started to march at the head of the whole uh, column. And it was all a bit of a a clusterfuck, but um, we were we were asked to uh, to follow three groups on what they called the hard left. We were going to follow uh, the Greens, the leader of the Greens. We were going to follow the leader of the Communist Party of Great Britain and the leader of the Rebel Clown Army, which was an anarchist group. Which, of course, being an anarchist group, didn't have a leader. Um, but you can't say that because then it wouldn't get commissioned because we needed three characters. So. Um, and then we had to convince the rebel clowns that we were going to profile all of them, all 65, because they were all leaders. And <laughs> quietly, knowing, quietly knowing that 64 of them were never going to make it on screen, um, unless it was a consensual decision-making cycle where they voted with hand signals. Um, what was funny there was that... Um, on the day of the uh, of the Glen Eagles uh, uh, the gathering of the G8, the clowns had decided to uh, blockade the access road so the delegates couldn't get there. But they had also thereby blockaded the bus full of Greens supporters, and right behind it, a slightly shabbier bus with the last six members of the Communist Party of Great Britain. None of them who could get to their protest. So this enormous shit fight between the Greens, the clowns, and the communists erupted. And I think the big lesson that I learned there for activists is that, you know, shit governments stay in power if the opposition can't unite. So, Mark, I hope that you have better experience with your 100 community groups, and I, I wish you the best of luck with that. <laughs> Anyhow, over to Zach Grieve. Um, maybe we should run, just run, the, run a clip uh, it's the opening of episode three of a six-part series, six by 12 minutes, and then I'll tell you a little bit about it once we've seen that. So this is how he left it on the night he was arrested. Uh, yeah. Actually. Xbox games? Yeah. Um, Teenage bands? Yeah. Glennis, you haven't touched this room, have you? I mean, there's a tube of Savlon. Yeah. <laughs> why? Why not touch it? Um. Well, I always had that feeling that possibly. Um, <sighs> It's a miracle that this would be overturned and Australian justice wrong that possibly he would come home, that I would have him home again. So that just ran to the end of the opening credits and then the rest of the episode obviously followed and um, uh, I just wanted to show you the credits as well because I wanted to talk to you a little bit later on about sort of, um, you know, production values and w why television costs the amount of money that it costs and why when somebody says that, you know, a budget of, I don't know, 450000 for an hour of, of television is outrageous, it actually isn't because you're trying to, you know, do that kind of stuff. And, make these stories in a way that will make people remember them. And that goes as well for, you know, the music and everything else that goes with it. Um, so um, where to start? 
I, I think I'd like to tell you how how we got going on this, and and that was because I'd listened to Dan Box, uh, the presenter, do a podcast uh, on the Australian's website on the Bowerville murders. That podcast was wildly successful. Uh, it was downloaded half a million times, and um, it ultimately led or helped lead to a review of the acquittal of the man who was once prosecuted uh, for these murders. And uh, uh, it was uh, quite a sensational result. It was also an extremely good podcast. It was a really, I don't know, just you know, a podcast that you just put on while you were doing something else and you were just sort of slowly sucked into it. And, what, and then at some point you realized that you'd stopped doing that something else. You know, you stopped writing your report or reading your website and you were just completely invested in the story. And I thought that that level of storytelling that Dan brought to that audio podcast was just exceptional. And um, I called him, I'd never met him. And I said that, um, you know, I'd like to talk to him and meet him and see whether what he did in that podcast could be replicated in, in a video documentary series or a vodcast, as we called it. Again, you know, it all innovation uh, is the buzzword and it helps it helps fundraising so it wasn't a documentary anymore it was a vodka series <laughs> and um, and what we wanted to do was to um, basically have have w w what it became so six by ten minutes roll them out one day uh, at a time over the course of a week but do it for a newspaper I was really interested in uh, in broadening our own horizon and also because we in Australia, unfortunately, are fa fairly limited when you're trying to do, you know, social justice type of projects or crime or anything in that field. There really is only, uh, as an independent production company, the ABC or SBS. Um, and, um, and, and, you know, they have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people pitching at them. And the chances of getting projects up are, are reasonably slim. So it's important, you know, for us as filmmakers that we find other avenues as well as try to produce for the major national uh, public broadcasters. So that idea of doing something for uh, uh, for a newspaper was was enticing for that reason, and also because it could possibly bring with it the power of a of a newspaper campaign, a front page campaign. Now we know uh, from other examples that you know it can be used for uh, quite destructive uh, reasons as well. And it's not always great what, what gets done on the front page, but you know, every now and then when the right cause gets taken up, it can be really um, impactful. So um, I talked to Dan. We pitched it to uh, the Australian. John Lyons was still at the Australian at the time, uh, overseeing the digital, um, uh, the, 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 the digital side of things. And uh, John had a television background, so he was immediately interested and kind of became a champion within the organization for the project. So we got them on board. Then we uh, talked to Screen Australia. Uh, interestingly, uh, Screen Australia um, said, "Well, you know, but yeah, but you know, why would News Corp ever work with us? That's like you know, quite an unusual fit." And News Corp told us, "Well, you know, you're going to get money from Screen Australia for us. That's never going to work." So these two organisations, I don't know if they had ever even spoken to each other, but. Um, had had all these preconceived notions about each other, and in the end, you know, we're both really happy to back a good project. So it was a they were unusual bedfellows, but it really worked. And we we couldn't quite get to the budget with the money that was available, although Screen Australia made an enormous investment because they liked the idea of independent producers working for a newspaper. Um, and um, uh, so we got Crime and Investigation Channel on board as well. Uh, we had pitched it to the ABC, but that didn't work out for various reasons that I won't bore you with. But um, crime and investigation also being in that sort of, you know, News Corp uh, empire uh, was, a, was a pretty good fit. So they chipped in um, because the story that we ended up doing had an indigenous component. We also talked to NITV and Foxtel had very kindly said that if we could get NITV on board, they wouldn't mind if, that, if it went out simultaneously uh, or in some other shape or form with them. Unfortunately, with NITV, it turned out they can't actually commission uh, production companies that are not owned by indigenous owners. So, um, but they did say, look, come back to us once it's done and we would consider an acquisition. So a couple of weeks ago, it went out on NITV. Foxtel kept its word and said that's fine, even though they have the exclusive rights in Australia. So that was really terrific as well. And again, you know, quite of an unusual sort of... Um, uh, coalition of, of broadcasters and partners and then create new South Wales came on board and chipped in so we got there uh, we got the money and um, 
we uh, we set off. Um, well, I'll, I'll take one step back, which is you know how do we get to this story? Because unlike um, Karina and, and and all the other you know wonderful filmmakers who've been speaking here tonight, who had a very clear vision of what they wanted to achieve when they started making their film and had a passion and had a a topic that they really wanted to tackle. I had sort of the opposite problem. I had a fully funded project and I had Dan Box presenting it, but we were looking for a story that would be at least as strong as Bowerville and that would achieve something that was in the true crime sphere, but also needed to have a social justice component to it because uh, this is sort of a little bit inside baseball. But what was interesting is that if you're uh, an independent producer and you like journalistic films, you face a really unusual problem, which is that the ABC Current Affairs Department can't commission indies. So Four Corners can acquire films that are finished and can acquire films that have been made overseas, but they can't actually commission an Australian production company to make a project for them. They can only produce in-house, and there are charter issues there. Um, on the other hand, uh, Screen Australia, which you, know, you might then be able to go to, also doesn't commission current affairs programs. So you can't get current affairs commissioned, unlike the BBC, where there's a commissioning editor for current affairs for independent production companies. So in England, you can produce for Panorama and all these programs. You can't do that here. And so you're sort of little, you're little stuck. And, um, and if you try to circumvent it by saying, well, actually, you know, it's not a current affairs show, it's a true crime series. They'll go like, oh, yeah, but we don't fund true crime either. That's, <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's not a true crime series. It's a social justice documentary. We like social justice, so let's talk. <laughs> but these are the kind of hoops that you jump through when you're trying to get these projects off the ground. So we had the um, we, 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 we had sort of an, a, a, an odd problem, which was that we had a, a terrific coalition of partners and we needed a really good story. So um, I just started to ask around and, you know, we read all the time. We're in touch with journalists all over the country. That's just part and parcel of what we do. And one friend who was working up in Darwin said, you know, you should take a look at this story of Zach Grieve. So it's not as if it was a story that hadn't been reported before, like uh, John Safran had done a piece for the um, Sydney Morning Herald years before. Um, but it had kind of gotten stuck after that. Nobody had taken it up. Nothing had, nothing had changed for this kid. So I looked into it. It was a really interesting story. Started talking to Zach's mom, who you just saw there, and realized that in addition to what John had done, there was so much more to dig into. And also realizing the power of pictures, because that was a print piece and it was a couple of years old, but nobody had done a documentary on this situation. Now, the, 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 what that story was about and the reason that it did become, in the end, um, a campaign, and some people would have called it an activist campaign of sorts, is that this was the story of a kid who got involved in a murder plot. and. His, what the story was that his best, his best friend's mother was being abused by her partner. And she had come to the conclusion that unless she killed her partner, he was going to kill her, and there was no other way. And she enlisted her son to do it and paid him $15,000 to have her partner killed. She thought that the son was going to hire a hitman, but the son instead hired his two best mates, one of them being Zach Grieve. And he said, you know what, I'll give you five grand, I'll give you five grand, I'll keep five grand, we're going to get rid of this bastard. So plans were hatched. Everybody in Catherine knew about this. They were talking about it at parties, at high school parties. Everybody except for the victim probably knew what was coming. On the night that they had gathered to kill the victim, a local man called Ray Nichiforo, Sex better angels got hold of him, and he finally realized that this wasn't a video game that he was living it, which was his big hobby, which is playing video games all day. He realized that this was real, and when he came to that realization, he said, you know what, I'm, I'm out of here, I can't do this. So he asked the son, his friend, to take him home, which he did, and he thought that with that, it had all ended. He may have even thought that, you know, this was supposed to be a three-man job. Ultimately, there were just two guys there, so maybe it wouldn't happen at all. But either way, he was out, he went home, and he went to bed. Next day, he was arrested for murder because his friends went ahead with it, and they clumsily dumped the body next to the road where a guy working with a grader found it within hours. 
And he was, <laughs> he was convicted. He was not just convicted. He ended up with a jail sentence that was longer than the guy who murdered the victim and a jail sentence that was longer than the woman who paid for the killing. And he had fallen foul of a set of, of you know, quite complicated laws, but essentially one set of laws related to joint enterprise. So when multiple people agree to engage in a criminal activity, it doesn't matter who actually does the deed because you're all part of the plan, you're all equally uh, responsible. And the other set of laws were mandatory sentencing. Once he was considered a murderer, in the Northern Territory, the judge had no choice but to send him down for life with 20 years non-parole. It's just that the guy who actually killed the victim um, had, had some special circumstances because the, the victim had made threats to him, so that was seen as a provocation that gave him a two-year discount. And the mom had been abused for many years on end, so she wasn't convicted for murder at all. She was convicted for manslaughter because that was a circumstance under which these these um, charges could be downgraded. So she got seven years and was out after four. Zach is going to be in for at least 20, and he may be in for the rest of his life. So we had this bizarre situation that the only person to walk away from the plot ends up with the longest jail sentence. And it led to a situation whereby the judge himself said in the, in, in the sentencing uh, remarks that these mandatory sentencing laws inevitably lead to injustices. So you have a judge who says that his own sentence was unjust. So once we got that whole picture, we're like, yeah, this is the story we have to do. You know, This is just too good to be true, and it really needs to be addressed because mandatory sentencing, as we have come to learn, is a massive issue, especially in the Northern Territory, which has the highest incarceration rates of the entire developed world. So um, off, we went <laughs> off we went to Catherine. Now, normally when you make documentary films, as I'm sure many of you uh, know, and when you're trying to get them funded, you have to show a fair level of access. You know, the funding agencies and the broadcasters need to know that when they send you somewhere or pay you to go somewhere, you will get what you've promised them. So this is always a bit of a tricky issue because, you know, documentary films, you know, um, you always make three of them. You make the one that you pitch, you make the one that you find in the field, and you make the one that you find in the edit, and they're never the same. But you have to convince broadcasters that the one that you pitch is going to be a good one and that you're going to have you know, some really strong content. The truth is that when we left to make this film, we only had access to Zach's mom, and that was it. There was nobody else who'd said yes. The other problem was that nobody was really approachable over the phone because the chances of them saying no over the phone and then not being able to go to them once we got there were just too great. So the good thing about newspapers, which we learned, was that they trust their reporters. So for the Australian, having five lines from Glennis saying, I'm happy to talk to you guys, was enough. They just went, look, you know, we trust you, we trust Dan, off you go. We'll see you in a couple of months. And that was a really refreshing um, a re really refreshing attitude, aside from the paperwork, you know, a three-page contract instead of the sort of 75 pages which you have with public broadcasters. So it's not all bad <laughs> with working with News Corp. Um, it, was, um, it was really interesting. We set off to Catherine. We didn't really have much lined up other than Zach's mom. And um, I was talking earlier about, you know, your networks of friends and, 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 and mates and people who work in various jobs and have access to stories and things like that. That played out here as well, because when I was telling one of my friends about this story, he said, oh, I actually know a lawyer who's looking into Zach's case as part of an innocence type of project at the, uni at the Charles Darwin University, and I think she's got the full brief of evidence with all the police materials. Called her, she said, yes, come over, have a look, and this brief of evidence just turned out to be a treasure trove of material, just incredible, and it had been lying dormant for years, because this story, you know, is now, what is it, eight or nine years old, and nobody had touched this material, nobody had looked at it, so there were police interviews, audio interviews, it was just fantastic. Then we asked the judge, uh, the Supreme Court judge who had written the judgment whether he would be interviewed, he said yes, which was rare because he's a sitting judge. Um, we, um, we asked him if we could get access to the audio recordings of the trial, to which he said yes. So we got all of those audio recordings. And slowly this sort of, you know, wealth of material started to build up. 
and then things in Catherine started to fall into place. People started saying yes. We had an extraordinary um, afternoon with the Michiforo family. So they, they're a very powerful family, mango growers, uh, uh, graziers. And um, they um, uh, were also well known for not liking the media. They had not liked John Seffron's piece at all. Uh, Nino Nichiforo, the, the, the brother of the victim who owns the big house there, uh, is married to a, a really lovely lady who collects life-size um, uh, cement animals from Africa. And when you, when you drive up to the house, it's like driving, it's like going on safari, but the kind of sort of safari we're going to have to do in, you know, a couple of years if we don't improve our environmental performance because everything was dead. Um, but it's just a really quite bizarre uh, entry. But Saffron had really played on that in his piece and it had really hurt her badly. So when we showed up, w they were ready to kick us out. Um, but, you know, it was one of these funny things where... Um, uh, Nino was sort of struggling with um, hospitality on the one hand, you know, Northern Territory trade, and on the other hand, hating our guts before he'd spoken to us. And he literally came out and he said, I don't care what you've got to say, I'm gonna kick you out. First, we're gonna have a beer. <laughs> like, so, we end, <laughs> so we ended up, we ended up in Nino's house spent hours with him. The photographs came out, the photo albums. There were photographs of his auntie with El Capone. It got weirder and weirder. <laughs> but you know what? It was one of, these, it, one of these days when you think, fuck, this is just, you know, my, my, my very first boss in television at CNN used to say, you know, um, uh, <laughs> you know, you, could, you couldn't make it up, you know? And it's like, I can't believe they're paying me to do this. Uh, and that was one of these days where you're like, wow, you know, it's such a privilege to do this, you know, to have a license to be nosy and to just experience all these amazing things. And um, anyhow, so I digress a little bit, but um, um, uh, we got we got the family the family lined up of the victim. We heard their side of the story. Everybody eventually in town decided to talk. It became a bit of a thing because it's a small town. Everybody knew we're there. So um, I'll run one more clip. And uh, then I'll tell you a little bit about the aftermath of the series and what it did and the sort of campaign element of it. Um, shall we play it? Chris Malishko took the stand. So I decided the killing of Ray needed to be done now. So I started loading everything into the van. I started with a wrench, a baseball bat and a steel pipe. And did Zach have some conversation with you about that stage? Yes, he did. He came outside and he told me he couldn't help me anymore. I asked him if he was sure that he couldn't do it. And he told me that, that he just couldn't help kill someone. And I told him that I understood and I dropped Zach off at his house. This was the first time the authorities had heard this version of events. What else happened in the conversation? Is, is, this, is this the extent of it that you've, you've told us today? You can't remember anything else? About what exactly? The conversation you had with Mr. Malishko at the van at the time the weapons were being put in when you said, I'm sorry, I can't do this anymore. Yes, yes, that was it. You didn't try to stop him, you didn't try to discourage him. No. You didn't say, go to the police, Chris, there are other ways to deal with Ray. No, I just wanted to go home. Chris was my best friend and I couldn't wait for him to take me home. Zach's defence lawyers tell me the laws here in the Northern Territory mean it really didn't matter to the jury if Zach was there or not when the killing took place. From what you're saying, the way the law works, they could have themselves thought that Zach wasn't there. They could have believed everything he said, everything you said, mm. but they still had to find him guilty because the law they said... A direction from the judge. The judge told them you have to find Correct. him guilty Correct. because he was part of the That's planning right. and he didn't pick up the phone and tell the police. That's right. They were directed by the, by the judge. So he got... He Even got... if they believed he physically wasn't there, they had to find Correct. that. That's right. The lawyers say their only option was asking the jury to do something unthinkable. And, and, you know, what, what we were saying was, look, you know, that may be the situation. Yeah. But you have the power as a jury 
to just look beyond that and just say, look, uh, we're not going to be towed down that road. But I then mean, you're asking them to ignore the law. Well, sometimes justice requires the law to be ignored because of the injustice of the law. I mean, the application of that law created a severe injustice. A significant injustice puts a, a person in jail for life and uh, he wasn't there. He didn't do it. Now, tell me, where is the justice in that? Were you surprised with the verdict? Uh, yes, I was. Yeah. So um, basically, what happens? Uh, the story went out, or the the the, the story. The, the six episodes were released all in one go behind the paywall for a weekend. That weekend, uh, on the Saturday, the Australian ran a, ha a front page story which took up half the page on Zach and his family and his situation. And then throughout the week, continued to run front page stories that Dan wrote. Um, about uh, the case, things that we had learned since we got into edit, um, and uh, different elements of the, of the film that we thought would be good to highlight in print. What started happening is that in DNT, a lot of people started talking about this. Within a couple of days after the series was released, the government confirmed that uh, they were open to reviewing mandatory sentencing laws, Within a couple of days after that, the opposition um, had also publicly stated that they were now open to reviewing mandatory sentencing laws and that they would be looking at it. And this was the first time in 30 years that both sides of politics at the same time had agreed to do this. And in fact, the, um, uh, the, the president of the Criminal Lawyers Association of um, the NT, Russell Goldflam, tweeted that day and he said, 30 years I've been trying to do this, finally a tipping point, um, you know, extraordinary, that kind of thing. Um, and I don't say that to pat ourselves on the back. Why I'm saying that is because it shows the power of a campaign um, backed by a national newspaper. And if it's used for the right purposes, it can be extraordinarily powerful. Um, Zach's, uh, w we helped Zach's mom write an open letter to uh, a number of politicians. We were planning to publish that in the newspaper, but before we had a chance to do that, she'd already sent it off to, you know, pretty much everybody. Um, that letter ended up on the lap of the administrator of the NT, so the equivalent of the governor there. Um, and he uh, saw that as an application to open a mercy plea uh, case. So um, what's happening now is that the Attorney General's committee, who now has to look at that, um, we'll review sex case. It could take a long time, but they will look at whether or not he can be released early uh, based on the circumstances of the case uh, and also because the judge himself in his judgment had called on the admi NT administrator and said, you know, I would like you to review this case and, leave and, and let Zach out after 12 years instead of 20 because 12 is probably closer to what he would have gotten if we didn't have these laws so that he would at least be punished for the fact that he was part of the planning, but would also be rewarded, quote-unquote, for the fact that he walked away from it and not be treated as a murderer. So um, that's now all in motion, and things just, you know, really, really started to happen very quickly. Now, the, qu the question, of course, is, you know, what is it going to lead to in the long term? It's very easy for politicians to say, during that week, look, you know, we're going to change it and review it. And whether or not it's all going to happen, I don't know. But it has certainly built momentum that hasn't stopped yet. The great thing about these video projects as well is that, um, you know, you, um, you enter them for awards, you enter them for all kinds of things, and you do that because it keeps your project alive and it keeps your, public, it keeps your project in the public eye. So, you know, this was just nominated for something called the Golden Nymphs in Monte Carlo, which means that it's going to be shown during that TV festival to an entirely new audience. Uh, Virgin Atlantic just bought it. It's going to be on all their flights for a couple of months. And, you know, I mean, and that is not special. I mean, that happens with a lot of documentaries that get produced for television or for uh, the newspaper. Uh, I mean, for, 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 for digital. Um, but 
in our case, it's, it's especially gratifying because we know that, you know, it means that people in the Northern Territory will have to stay on it because the public will stay aware of the story. So I, I guess that's, uh, that's sort of what I wanted to say about that. Um, sorry if I sort of drifted off into weird corners every now and then, but uh, probably because I, did, because I didn't prepare, <laughs> prepare it. Um, but thank you very much for listening, and uh, my, my congrats to, uh, to all the other people who were up here. It's just terrific work, and it's just great to um, you know, see that sort of spirited work. And, and uh, anyhow, it makes me very glad to be part of this community. Thanks. You sure did. He once thanked me, and he said, and he said, I interviewed all the wrong people. <laughs> Dominic Case, Nell mentioned I'm with Climate Change by Elaine Roselle, and we screened uh, Nell's first film, The, the um, Saving Galilee, last year uh, to, to our group, in fact, to a large number in our group. Um, we haven't got around to screening the second film yet. Um, and I want to thank you, Nell, for showing us uh, the trailer tonight. It's really motivated me to come and uh, set up a screening. But my question is, with films like this and the way they're being screened by activist groups around the country, are we in fact preaching to the choir? I, uh, certainly they motivate the people who are already converted, but um, our friends in the inner west, the um, uh, Stobodani Sydney group, had a trial sort of door knock talking to people at, about Adani last week. And they came back and they said, even in the inner west, which is a pretty sort of progressive area, they said 30 to 40 percent of the people they spoke to either had never heard of Adani or knew nothing about it at all. Is there a way that this sort of film can get out to a wider audience or, or do they need other methods? Facebook, by the way, I don't think is a method because the Stopadani group is all over Facebook and uh, obviously not reaching these people. So I guess that's sort of a distribution question rather than a production question, but what's the answer? Um. <laughs> you got the answer? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, the first film is now online, so anyone can access it. Um, and the next one will be online as well for anyone to access. But in the initial period, it's very much about movement building. So bringing people together in real time and space um, to have discussions, to work out next steps. So, I mean, the activist groups, the, the 160 Stopadani groups across Australia, um, they come together, they, they just, you know, the film gives them a, a discussion point of focus and then they work out their next steps, what they're going to do. Are they going to go to their MP? Are they going to have an action outside um, you know, their MP's office? What are they going to do? And um, I think that's, I mean, I think there was, there's been over 100 local screenings of the film so far, and it, I think we put it out in April. So it's a, you know, it, it's, it's something, it's a, it's a high ask, you know, it's a big thing to ask people to do, to put on a screening. It's not an easy thing to do. But following the first film, the groups have experience in doing that, so they readily picked it up and ran with it again. Um, but, I mean, I think, you know, as they say, even if you <laughs> have one person come along and see something and think, geez, you know, I'm going to get active, I'm going to get involved, I'm going to get motivated around this, then, you, you know, you've done your job. Pre preaching to the converted, I guess, um, you know, we were lucky that we had a general cinema release and we tried some different strategies and we were on Virgin and, you know, all these other platforms mm. we've, we've had um, quite, quite a broad, you know. We, I mean, what, what I find is really interesting, um, because we weren't with one environmental group or whatever, we were actually across a whole lot of different um, partners who none of them paid for the film and none of them had editorial influence. So what we were able to do was we were able to activate those groups where they could market the film and encourage people to go and see it when it was in its general release and then cinema on demand. But since then, I mean, we have screenings with people from fashion, I'm people here to tell you that I introduced in cinema, to the environment. You sure did. He once thanked me and he said, and he said, I introduced you to all the wrong people. way that I converted was to to try to catch people who were interested and, and also, um, you know, grab a younger youth market through some of the people who appeared in the film, but also 
um, you know, pay homage to people like Valerie Taylor who activated mm. an older audience. And as a result, our screenings, we had, I've, I've been in screenings with three-year-olds and 93-year-olds. Um, and we're in schools. We've got six and a half thousand schools who have taken our short films and have used those as teaching aids. And we spent $100,000 on our education campaign alone. So that's, I guess, how we tried to infiltrate. Mm. Well, um, I'll just add quickly to that. Um, you know, doing a series about mandatory sentencing and kind of saying that it's crap, uh, which is traditionally seen as a left-wing cause, and doing that for a right-wing newspaper uh, was really effective because we would have never reached uh, those type of you know uh, viewers if we had done this for the Guardian online, for instance. And um, you know, whether you like the Australian or not. The truth is that in government circles, it's incredibly influential. So when the, when News Corp started campaigning against mandatory sentencing on its front page for a week, it had a real effect in the Northern Territory, and um, and that was a, a, an interesting phenomenon. So it's good to uh, I guess to keep an open mind about these things when you're trying to work out where to place your stories and who to work with. I think with um, the sort of stuff we've been doing, to a certain extent, the, your first audience are the converted and then they convert other people. So uh, they share, that you get more likes, the likes attract likes, and all of that sort of stuff happens. And you develop a kind of point where there's a whole lot of social media sloshing around on the internet, and on Facebook or where other social media, like currencies slosh around the world, and some of it sticks, and you pick up people. And then I think you can actually shift the zeitgeist of the way people perceive the real politic at a local level. So I do think you can change. And you can communicate detail and emotion in a way that print media can't. And if someone who you respect or like or want to see something of, you find them funny and engaging and you know all, all of the good old-fashioned showbiz values... Um, you know, colour and movement, <laughs> it kind of works. It, it, it self-replicates. And then the most interesting sort of feedback for me was when people like uh, Ben Quilty and Sam Neill and Julia Zamiro and there's quite a few others, uh, even, even um, some quite elderly people, sent us stuff on phones without being solicited. Um, I'm a producer, Penny Robbins. Karina, can you tell us how you would finance your film Blue, given that Good Pitch is now wound up? Is it possible? Um, it's a great question. <clears throat> and I, I probably would say I have no um, answers to that. I feel like I was um, a very um, fortunate individual who was in the right place at the right time, and that's often the way things get made. It's not the great ideas that get made, it's not the best films, the best stories, it's literally all those, the alchemy of, of the right people, the right money, the right relationships being there. But um, I don't know that I'll make another one like this. I really don't know. I would love to think that I could because I feel like I've had so many learnings. Um, so I think it will, it will be hard. I certainly, you don't uh, arrive somewhere after having made one successful film um, but I do feel that there are new models and that's part of being a producer is being as creative in the way that you find your finance and the way that Ivan's talked about um, and the partners that you've made as these guys have talked about um, and these new uh, things that are changing consistently in the digital world that hopefully mm. storytellers will continue to, to find their place. Yeah. I think it's also really important in, in, in that respect, the, the campaign at the moment that the industry... Um, is waging uh, to make sure that the, the content quotas stay in place and to make sure that um, broadcasters are compelled to put an, you know, a, a guaranteed minimum number of hours of Australian content on their screens and to bring s faults like Netflix and Stan into that fold as well is going to be hugely important because I mean, the one great thing about Netflix is that it has shown that there is a, you know, an, an insatiable appetite for really good long-form documentaries. The problem is you need money to make them and, and platforms like Netflix have that money. But, you know, if they're not compelled um, in return for their entry to the Australian market 
to start commissioning here, they'll probably just keep commissioning in America, American stuff, you know, with which they're more familiar. So sort of our, uh, our great hope that these things will, uh, uh, will happen soon as well. So we have to be activists in our own industry. Exactly, well. yeah. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I think Good Pitch from 2014 um, raised more than $14 million using that model of getting philanthropists into the room with documentary filmmakers, mm. which really worked in its moment um, mm. and did start in Britain with the Brit Doc project. Um, so, but uh, as the filmmakers have said, we have to keep reinventing new models as the landscape shifts. Mm. Either of you got anything more to say on that one? Just that, you know, when, you, when you're making a film that... Um, is very much anti-government. It's very hard to get funds from the government, you know, and it's hard to get um, a, a broadcaster to put it on. So, I mean, we did have... And, and, and that's why we wanted to, you know, we weren't going to seek money. Everyone says, why don't you get it on this, this and this? But, you know, we can't. <laughs> it's not possible. That's because it's an advocacy film. Yeah. And that was a f kind of a fine line too. Is it a... You know, it's a campaign film... But, you know, you have that documentary urge to follow people and sort of be that, um, be kind of removed. But it's very much a, yeah, campaign film. Yeah. Rina, you mentioned debt, uh, trying not to get the audience to shit themselves. I mean, when you <laughs> consider, for example, what's going on on the planet in, in the oceans, it's, it's truly terrifying. How do you, as a... Uh, how do all of you as documentary filmmakers remain positive and believe in your creative process and and how do you tread that line with you know between getting the message out and making the audience just give up you know and <laughs> think the ship's sinking we're all doomed <laughs> how do you how do how do you keep us active how, which is what we want to be yeah, exactly and so i think that no matter what it is that you're tackling no matter you know if you're confronted and you have this story that you're burning to tell and that you feel that you know this is something that oh my god it's so whether it's depressing or confronting or whatever the point is that when you're a filmmaker you're taking action so you can work with those difficult confronting um, emotions because it's only when you're stuck in that state of despair and you're giving up that and you just don't want to do that to the audience either and so you know for me as a filmmaker I can look at incredibly distressing and difficult subjects because I feel that at least if I'm engaged in the action of communicating and talking and creating awareness and change then I can do that job every day of the week um, and then to serve the audience with some tools is really important as well. I also think um, you know the, there's a there's a big movement in America at the moment uh, which is loosely termed uh, solutions journalism I think it's really important that we start engaging with that here as well um, because what they have shown and what their research has shown is that stories, for instance, online stories that offer solutions to problems are actually read much more than the stories that don't. But as journalists, we're, we're trained so much to just point a finger at where the pain is and, and point out the injustice and you know the corruption and all of that stuff. But we don't really look at where where are people doing it better, and where are the examples of how we can, you know, avoid these mistakes. So, for instance, you know, in the in the, if somebody were to write a newspaper article about you know the, the the development of the pending privatization of Bondi Pavilion, are there examples of other councils where a similar building? was kept in public hands, but they actually found a way to make it profitable and got the community engaged and all of that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, what uh, David Bornstein at the, at the New York Times, who's kind of leading this, this, this charge, is saying is that, you know, unless you um, are able to point to better solutions and better ways of doing things, it's actually really hard to hold people to account. And I think once we start doing that with, with films on the, the kind of topics that we are that we are discussing here, um, I think we will find that the levels of engagement of the audience will start to rise as well because it makes them feel empowered. Yeah, and, and the one thing I would say about that is that um, you don't want to wrap it up with a bow at the end and say, okay, you've sat through all of this and this was really a difficult subject, but don't worry, here's the solution. It's all fine. It's mm. that the reality is that um, the content that we're talking about here is all about making people active and engaged. And so it's not just go, going through the process of 
having watched something confronting that by the end you find, oh, don't worry, it was banned or that person's got the solution. It's actually what I intended to do in the film that I made was throw it back to the audience and say, okay, well, I'm going to give you a real shove, but now it's up to you because as mm. individuals, we all act, have to actually be in, actively engaged in in the decisions of what's happening in society today. So that was my one little caveat on that. And also, I guess, the thing about the most ugly, challenging uh, things that we face is they're very exciting because the people who are trying to solve them are often innovating and moving in a way that is really inspiring. So it's by going to those really challenging places that we do find the essence of why humans keep surviving. So either of you got something to say on that one? No. You know, something actually I wanted to ask, um, obviously all these filmmakers are really brilliant at engaging the subject and dealing with the emotions that surround that. Nell, you were working, um, you know, it, it's, it's one thing to have subjects in your film, it's then another thing to have very impassioned communities which um, are carrying lots of emotions sometimes for years. That would have been a special challenge in your circumstance. How did you weave your way through that to concentrate on the craft of making your film? <laughs> um, I think, you know, the communities and their passion um, are, are just wonderful to tap into. You know, you, you can um, just talk to these people. I mean, one of the guys I spoke to in the, in the last film was... Um, a rabbi, Rabbi Rabbi Jonathan Karen Black um, from Melbourne. He, he's with ARC, Australian Religious Response to Climate Change, and he kept saying to me, do you want the real answer or the one that you want to hear? I was like, um, give us the one that I want to hear because I'm not going to put that other one out there that we're doomed and it's all over, you know. I'm not going to I'm not going to put that message out to the public because the, the, the purpose of the film is to inspire people. Um, but what I what I found in the you know working in the movement you know there's this thing that the movement eats itself you know mm -hmm. there are so many people in the movement that are that have been up you know they're fighting the biggest coal companies on earth they're, they're fighting the governments they're little kind of fleshy people who don't have much resource you know we've only got our imagination and um, what we can come up with and our our passion to um, get us through but there is a point at which um, People can just get so, and this is what happened with the film, they're just so anxious about having to win, we've got to stop this thing, that it turns in on itself. And that's what happened with the last film. It, it just, um, it, 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 was a, it, was a, it was a terrible, <laughs> terrible situation for me to be in, um, you know, the focus of this anxiety, everybody else's anxiety and... In a, in, a, in a sense, I, I thought it must have been madness, you know, and sort of I, let, I came out of it saying, okay, you guys, you all need counselling, right? <laughs> that, that was the big take home. Um, people have got to look after themselves in the movement, you know. It, it is incredibly difficult and um, sustained activism can, um, you know, you just got to look after each other, be nice to each other. And, um, you know, take a holiday occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> I guess what I would have to say at this point is I didn't have any of those uh, extraordinary conundrum that goes with the neuroses of longer form storytelling. When I, and I've, I've done longer storm, form storytelling and it can get neurotic, and I, you know, particularly when there are big vested interests. I had a little core group. I didn't want any more than five minutes of any one person. Stick your mug up here and say something. The shot of Pat, she was on the way to the beach, I grabbed Pat walking past, she's looking like a drowned rat, and she went straight down the barrel, completely unedited. <laughs> so for me, the, you know, it wasn't about any of the fluff or presentation, it was just about from the heart. And also, <laughs> because I'm not a very good editor, I wanted people to do it in one, and I want to be able to stick a tag on, on the end of it that I can generate really simply. And when, it's, when, I, when I had an evening to cut six of them together, I, I, I could you know, vary the tag or vary the music or whatever. But it was about having the components there, chop, chop, chop. Oh, God, fuck now. Let's put, let's put it up. Um, 
you know, that, that sort of, because it's a, it was a volunteer kind of thing. I, I, you know, it needed to be really efficient. And I've still got a whole lot that I haven't cut, but we won. You know, we, we changed public opinion with short grabs. There are lots of activists around Sydney who are making 10, 15, half hour, half hour films, six minute films, uh, you know, all around Sydney. They don't get watched. So my advice to anyone who wants to make agitprop, and that's exactly what that was, it is agitprop, which is a kind of 60s, 70s term for stirring the possum, <laughs> to put it bluntly, uh, agitprop, you know, stirring the shit and presenting passion and opinion as effectively as you can. Keep it short, keep it simple, use celebrity shamelessly <laughs> and use, have the common touch at all times and go for it. Mark, you had a couple of films from your Facebook um, posts that had an extraordinary number of views. Um, would you like to enlighten us on how many views they were on yeah. the higher figures of some of them? No, we're, talk we're talking about Milan Rouge Girls had it's a long time ago, but and that did have millions. But um, <laughs> <laughs> there was also activism. In the yeah. Well, it was you know, well, it was a sort of religious film, really. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, the, the uh, Milan Rouge is a, is a convent to you know, it's a sort of finishing school convent. <laughs> and the next street is rude as abbess, and the ballet mistress is the abbess. You know, there's there's no doubt. That's a whole other love story, um, but no. Some of the some of the social media clips went to. I think the bit the, the biggest one was Caton, who went to sixty seventy thousand. Ve but very quickly. I mean, the first thirty thousand happened in three days or four days, and then it began to replicate. And so after two weeks, you're at a sort of squishy number around fifty six fifty seven thousand, and then over time. It builds up a bit more, and sometimes they have a second wave if you relaunch them. Um, the average viewership uh, of the people who were known community identities was ten to fifteen thousand. Sam Neill went up to twenty-five. Jack Thompson went up to about sixty. Uh, look at. Some of the le some of the, surprisingly some of the ones I really liked were the ones with the little kids that we started. They were really sweet, gorgeous kids. They didn't have many. They weren't famous, and they were probably watched by a few mums. Yeah, I think I did a little um, <laughs> clip with Michael Caton as well in the Tony Windsor campaign. It had about one hundred and fifty thousand views pretty yeah, quickly. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. He's a. I mean, he's an amazing guy. Um, there's not many celebrities that will step forward for a cause. And he's an exception. And um, and he has the common touch. Yeah, People and the like castle, him. of course. Yeah. That, that is just, it, it speaks to all the stories. But you can write something for Michael and he will, he will sort of look at it and go, oh yeah, Gouldy, uh, and walk away for a minute and give him a couple of points. And he'll come back with something that's actually quite poetic and nail it in one. And then if he fucks up and you sort of, can we do another one? Actually, they get worse. <laughs> so go with the go with the first one, and try not to edit the the performance at all. Uh, I think it's really interesting that something that we're just skirting around here too, as well as in this information heavy age, when so many people and and someone mentioned that you know there was a percentage of people who'd never even heard of Adani. People actually do lock down. There's only so much they can absorb. But mm. how um, these filmmakers are using the attention span deficit um, to to work with that, to make something that is six parts, 12 minutes, or to make a very, very short clip, and yet still make sure that there is meaningful content in there, is really the challenge of being able to keep working with your audience and changing the form to kind of meet that without kind of giving up and going, well, it's, it's impossible, you know, nobody will listen to anything with any meaning that goes past. It, it's so, there's so much rubbish out there. There's so much noise. You can cut through that. And the Queen and Zach Reeve shows that. And so do these other mm. um, instances. Oh, look, a, comment, a comment about social media, if I may. A, a if you look at the metrics and really analyse the metrics, you discover that a lot of people watch stuff 
with the sound off. So you will notice more and more the more savvy social media uses are subtitling everything. Yeah. Just curious Everyone. with Karina, um, I follow Blue since it was launched at Sydney Film Fest. Um, and noticing the campaign that you've had, the call to action campaign, I was just curious what you thought was the most effective part of that campaign. And I was also curious about what you mentioned earlier being um, that you said you had, oh thanks Mark, that's very nice of you, catering to my height. Um, you had uh, about a hundred school uh, education programs. I was just curious to know more about what those entailed and how the results went. So the most, I mean, the funding uh, looks at a whole lot of key issues, but plastic pollution by far has been the real activation point. And um, you would have found this too, Ruth. It's the ability for the individual to go home and actively make a change in their life. Um, but the way that individuals then build communities and that change is now filtering through and. You know, it came out at a great time where we had war on waste and all kinds of things where communities were being activated. So of the, of the issues, that's been the one that has been um, the easiest for people to get their hands on. Um, schools, 6,500 schools through Cool Australia, uh, where we have done lesson plans on um, ocean sustainability issues from kindergarten through to year 11, free resources, 20 short films, bam. My question is for Ivan. Um, I'm interested to know about different platforms. I mean, obviously, working with the Australian is kind of an odd combination, um, especially for um, video. And uh, I'm just wondering what you've found or learned from that and where you see it going, because obviously it's a shrinking market and very difficult for documentaries if you're not making series. Uh, the ABC and SBS, as we know, aren't commissioning one-offs anymore. Um, so I'm interested to know what you've learned in terms of other um, platforms that could house this content. I, I really hope for the sake of one of documentaries that, that, that will you know, get Netflix and, and Stan and other S-Faults to, to have to commission. I think um, uh, that is, well, that, that, that is our great hope. Uh, because, as you say, it's harder and harder to get one-offs on, on television. Um, it's, it's, it's really hard to know. Like, um, interestingly, when we did our, our series for The Australian, um, while it caused a lot of noise, a lot of that noise was actually created by the newspaper coverage rather than the series. So... Our greatest audience for that project came not necessarily from it being streamed on the Australian, but from the broadcast a month later on Crime and Investigation Channel. So we did a 74-minute a, a or a 90-minute 90, 90 commercial hour and a half, uh, sort of seamless version of these six episodes, and that streamed as a special on Crime and Investigation and got quarter of a million viewers, which for Crime and Investigation is huge. Right. Uh, you know, it's not a lot if it were to go out on ABC uh, uh, although these days, who knows? But um, uh, it's it's it for for a subscription channel that was enormous uh, and and was larger than anything we would have gotten through the Australian. So I'm I'm not sure. I don't know what the answer is. I don't, you know, I don't think that producing video content for newspapers is necessarily the way to go. Um, uh, I also really like long form. Sort of chopping it up in shorter bits kind of pains me. But at the same time, it was a really interesting experience, and I'm sure you know we will be we'll, we'll continue the conversation with newspapers about about projects like this. I think you just have to accept that you need to be flexible. And what I do love about this project is that it now exists in three forms. There's a six part series which can live online, and you know which you can sell you know to uh, airlines and God knows what where they now want to run web series because that's the big thing now with in flight entertainment. There's a one-hour version, which we're distributing internationally, and then there's the 90-minuter, which Foxtel will keep running for the next couple of years and will you know, we'll update if there are updates in the case. Mm -hmm. And I think that flexibility of the content is really important and will probably become more and more important, finding different ways to cut up what you have to satisfy whatever platform you can get it on. 
We have just about covered everything I was hoping to get through, and that brings us to the conclusion yeah, of this marvellous evening. Thank you so much for coming. Thank our illustrious guests for their time.